Hello everybody and welcome back. I am KRX and we are going to be doing a tutorial for complete beginners for Europa Universalis 4. This is a no DLC tutorial. Maybe you just picked the game up for $8 to $10 on a sale and you just want to try it out. Make sure you're going to enjoy it uh, before sort of targeting specific DLC that, that you might uh, enjoy most. Also playing the game in the base game, I, I do recommend that. One, because it's still a great game. And number two is you can build the context that you need and the understanding that you need that um, to, to decide which DLCs you even want to get. How do you want to change your game? How do you want to enhance your game? And stuff like that. It can be hard to do that if, if you're not understanding how to play the game in the first place. This is going to be a very hand-holdy uh, sort of uh, playthrough. Uh, we're going to be trying to build up a context of how to play the game thematically. I'm going to be trying to teach the game like, like someone would teach a, a board game rather than just sort of reading off tool tips and reading things off to you, which of course is not particularly exciting. You know, if you're going to go learn how to play a board game, you don't, you hope that the person teaching you doesn't just read the rule book to you. That's kind of boring. But instead, we're going to be trying to build up uh, and role play and experience the game from the perspective of of um, the immersive perspective of who we're playing as and what we're doing and to build up the context from there and eventually hopefully weave in most of the complicated uh, gameplay systems and mechanisms back in naturally and over time in such a way that we can eventually get to the point where we can just have fun playing the game and uh, know what we're doing and also find success in the game uh, even as a brand new player so let's go into single player here now this is up to date as of uh, a major patch that is coming out in 2021, 1.31, the Leviathan DLC drop and also the Southeast Asian patch, the free patch that comes with it. So this is completely up to date. Many of the tutorials, unfortunately, are, are not going to be up to date on the internet, but also the base games tutorial is horribly out of date. So hopefully this will be um, up to date and, and useful in that sense. However, again, this is not using the Leviathan DLC. This is not using any DLCs. This is a completely no DLC playthrough. We will have additional tutorials for DLC playthrough. And we do already have tutorials on the channel that are n made as of 2020. And those are m pretty up to date as well uh, for additional perspectives, uh, nation perspectives, and also some tutorials with DLCs, but we'll make more tutorials as well. We're going to be just pumping out the tutorials. And I find that actually what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get better at doing the tutorials, right? I, I look at this more like uh, being a good player, being a bad player, It doesn't that doesn't make you good at making a tutorial for the game, right? But making a tutorial for a game as complicated as this kind of takes a, a thoughtfulness to think about what is it, you know, you have to kind of ground yourself in the uh, perspective uh, of a new player, right? You have to think about it from their perspective. Uh, otherwise, you can sort of take things for granted and, and skip over things that are uh, non-obvious, right? Um, I have played the game for a couple thousand hours, but no way am I a, uh, an, a, a, an amazing player. I'm just a, a player that knows how to find some success in the game and knows how to press the buttons and, and make decisions. So hopefully I can relay that uh, to you guys. Um, I'm thinking for this tutorial. We've actually made tutorials with Portugal, Castile, England, um, Muscovy and the Ottomans. I'm thinking France. France is one of my favorite nations. I will say, however, France is not without its challenges. France is a very powerful nation and it has its challenges. Usually I would say that if you were really struggling with the game uh, in the attempts that maybe you've already tried or, or maybe you're following this tutorial and it's a little bit of a struggle, check out, uh, try Portugal. Apply some of the same concepts. Everything that we learn with France can be applied to Portugal and vice versa. It's it's the what we're going to be trying to teach is the process of playing the game, not the specifics of how to play as one nation or another. It's pointless for me to teach you how to play France. That's pointless. I'm going to teach you how to play your Robert Rosales 4, and then you can take that procedural understanding and that uh, context that we learn, and you can apply that to any nation. However, we do have tutorials with Portugal and Muscovy. Those are fantastic new player nations. Uh, France is very powerful, and France is set up for success, but France does have a lot of complicated aspects to its geography and its position in the world and its importance in this time period. Um, let's get into the game. Uh, Iron Man mode is, is fantastic. That's how I like to play. I will be doing normal mode just for recording purposes. Iron Man mode, even for new players, totally fine. It just means you got to roll with the punches, right? You got to roll with the punches. Doesn't make the game any more difficult. Just means that, you know, you have to you have to live with the consequences of your choices, and you won't be tempted to reload any save files and stuff like that. Which I personally think um, is going to be unnecessary if we can just make a good 
solid decisions as we're going along based on the thematics and the role-playing perspective that we're going to be in as France, we should be able to, uh, we should be able to survive even if we have some setbacks. So we are in the world. We have clicked play. We've clicked on France and we've clicked play. Now we could have clicked on Poland, right? We could have clicked on Hungary. We could have clicked on Lithuania. We could have clicked on somebody in in Africa or Asia or North America. There's hun literally hundreds of nations you can play in this game. It is highly recommended that you do start in Europe as a new player because the game is kind of centered around Europe. Everything is kind of balanced around Europe. The game, after all, is Europa Universalis. So it is all kind of from the European perspective. But they have done a lot over the last many years of developing this game to enhance the other regions of the game. But this will this will force us to kind of deal with the, the widest... Um, reach and the most depth of mechanisms and, and get us the, the most solid understanding of the game plus a couple of little goofy things that you have to deal with when you're playing outside of Europe you don't have to deal with uh, uh, when you're playing in Europe so that's nice so in some ways it's simplified and in some ways it's actually kind of like a better representation of the full uh, breadth of the game yeah and as soon as we get it it's like it's kind of overwhelming we got all these icons down here I'm going to zoom out a little bit to clean those up a bit. And we got we got uh, all kinds of different, what seem to be like resources and currencies all up in here, all kinds of stuff over here. We got buttons down here. It's just, it's kind of an overload, right? Right when you get in the game. So let's just talk about the game a little bit. Now we picked France. We are France. It says up here, we have the French crest. We got France here. We are France. And we will always be France unless we update our name or change our name or something like that. But for the most part, France is going to stay France. This is a real-time strategy game, but the game is paused right now. So right now it is it is uh, November 11th, 1444. And we can think about what that means historically, right? We're about 50 years before Columbus, you know, sailing the ocean blue, going over and discovering the new world. We have no knowledge of the new world. At least we don't have a detailed knowledge of it. We might have uh, whispers of it. Um, we might, there might be some people expecting there to be a continent over here that's been undiscovered, maybe because of, you know, uh, lore, you know, Viking lore and so on and so forth, sort of like, um, you know, mythology and stuff of, of lands over here. But, but we don't have any actual current knowledge of that. This is before the time of discovering the New World for the bulk of the Neur European uh, empires. And uh, we can only see, we, you know, presumably we know that Africa is a much larger continent, but, but this is the, the North African uh, section here is the is the bit that we have contact with that we could talk to uh, send emissaries to these nations we're more familiar with these northern african nations and so on and so forth as you can see as we get to the far east again we might know about the far east but it isn't something that uh, we're able to diplomatically engage with people over here and as the game evolves as time goes on as the world becomes a smaller and smaller place throughout history as it did because of global trade and colonization and all these other things that will be simulated in the game as time moves forward we will have ultimately learn more about the world and uncover um, more of the world and in our diplomatic reach and our interest in the rest of the world will expand as we play the game so eventually we will be able to see uh, eastern asia in the new world and so on and so forth in fact france right we might even have a role to play in the colonization of the new world and uh, africa and so on and so forth but the game is paused right now if we want to unpause we can hit we can hit the space bar to unpause, but I'll leave it paused for now. In fact, we're probably not even going to unpause for the first episode or two. There's a lot to just look at in terms of assessing our environment and our situation right now and, and getting it, getting our feet on the ground uh, before we even unpause the game. But but just to, just to kind of understand, if we unpause the game, when I say it's a real-time game, that's what I mean. The time will continually flow in real time. Like, it'll go to... Um, the 12th and then it'll be the 13th and the 14th and the 15th and it'll just keep flowing through the days and eventually flowing through the months and eventually flowing through your years and you have a little bit of a speed modifier so you can adjust the speed here you know two speed three speed we'll keep it on two speed for now but this is our little speed speed five is very very fast and speed one is very very slow so um we can adjust the speed up here and then if we unpause it'll it'll flow we'll talk a little bit more about that when we're actually ready to unpause but for the most part, I don't want to talk about any of these currencies. I don't want to talk about any of this over here. I don't want to talk about any of these buttons down here. I don't want to talk about anything on the screen, iconography-wise. I just want to think about, okay, we're France, right? We could zoom in here. We are France. It's kind of a complicated mess over here, to be honest, right? We got, like, 
It seems to be some little nations in here, sort of like France is kind of broken up into all these little bits. But we can hover our mouse over these places and be like, okay, the nice French blue, this is us. In fact, we actually look a little discombobulated right now. We got a little piece down here, and we got sort of a big piece up here that includes Paris up here. That seems to be our capital. Nice little crown up here. So we got we we're kind of split in two right now. We're kind of split in two. We got the red. The English have actually landed in Normandy and in Gascony. So that's actually kind of a problem because if we think about France today, right? And even even if we go back in time before 1444, this is clearly French land. Like this is this is France. Like as far as we're concerned. This should be France. So the fact that uh, that uh, England is, is on our shores is kind of a problem. We got uh, Castile down here, Aragon, Portugal. You know, as we look in, we sort of got a little bit of a blob here of a bunch of tiny little nations. We got Burgundy here. And we can actually start clicking on these nations. We can click on our own provinces. This gives us a province detail. Lots of symbols and numbers here that we don't care about at all. But we, likewise, we can click on other nations and we get a slightly, there's a slightly modified screen here if we're clicking on another nation like Burgundy. Well, we can get some opinion. One of the things I'm just going to look at just a basic thing is, uh, does Burgundy like us, right? We are playing as France. What do we want to do? Well, it looks like we're, we, it looks like we're missing some of our land, right? It looks like we're clearly missing some land in here. It looks like we're missing land in Normandy. We, shouldn't we have this Gasconay land as well? Why is England here? You know what I mean? So, so already I'm thinking thematically as France. Like, we need to take back this land from England. Like, like it's going to be a war against England, right? And historically, if you're familiar with the history of the time, is we're at near the end of the Hundred Years' War. So we've been battling with England for off and on for a hundred years at this point. And there's going to be another war. There's going to be the final war of the Hundred Years' War coming up. And it is going to be fought over these these provinces over here um, and, and, and stuff like that. So... That is going to be happening. There is going to be war against England. In fact, if we click on England, we could see they hate us. They're a rival to us. They've rivaled us. They're minus 137. It's red. This is a scale from minus 200 to plus 200. So these guys are very much uh, not happy with us. They desire um, some of our uh, wants your subject. They want some of our subject provinces. They want some of our subjects. Um, they want uh, some of our provinces. There's border friction. They're a rival. It's, it's just all kinds of bad. We don't like them and they don't like us. Burgundy doesn't like us either. Holy cow, we got rivalry, rivals on both sides, right? Rivals on both sides over here. We got Brittany over here. Brittany likes us. They're friendly. Plus 23, a nice positive relationship there. We could probably get an alliance with Brittany. So we, again, if we're thinking, of, hey, we're surrounded by a couple enemies. Um, we have land that we're going to need to take in war against England. England looks rather powerful, to be honest. I mean, they must have achieved this land in one way or another. So they have a certain amount of military might, clearly. Um, we're going to want some allies maybe to help us with that. Maybe we could go into Iberia and see Castile likes us. Castile looks like a fairly powerful country. Castile could help us out. Aragon likes us as well. Okay, that's interesting. So Aragon and Castile both like us. Portugal is neutral towards us. They do have a positive opinion, but they'll trust us somewhat, but they are neutral. So being neutral, they might be less likely to get an alliance with us. They might quite literally just be too far away to care about us. So distance does play a big aspect when it comes to diplomacy. But all we're doing right now is we're just seeing who's who's what's going on. Okay, these guys here, if we look at them, they are loyal. Oh, wait a second. They're loyal. Is a vassal of French. Oh, these are vassals of ours. These are actually subject. Some of these are subject nations of ours. In fact, let me point you guys over to the first button that we're going to click on on the screen is the diplomatic map mode down here. It's the dove. So we're going to click on this. These map modes are incredibly important for seeing the world at a glance. If we click on this and we have no nation selected, it's going to default to selecting our own nation. And it shows France. We are the uh, sort of nice green here. The teal is actually representing all of our subject nations. These are all vassals of ours. So actually, technically, this is all kind of France. It's just that these are slightly more independent nations that are um, under our umbrella of the French Empire. Kind of working somewhat in autonomously, but but ultimately owing their allegiances to us. These are nations that would uh, honor us in a war, a defensive or aggressive. They will be forced to follow us. They are also paying us a certain amount of tribute and taxes and things like that. Provence is actually in blue. What's going on with Provence? Provence is also, what the heck? Provence has got like all kinds of weird discombobulation. This is kind of a fragmented part of Europe, to be honest, right? And that also, the other thing about the diplomatic screen is it can help us kind of see where we are, right? We're this nation. These are our subjects. Ooh, it's, it's showing us that, yeah, these are rightfully our land, right? This is a core province for France. France considers this to be one of her core provinces. 
So the stripy bits, you can see how this, the green is the same color as our, our land here. It's telling us, hey, this land is rightfully ours. England has land that is rightfully ours. And the rest of the world acknowledges that this is rightfully ours. So we're going to have a claim. We have a claim. We have a justification for taking back this land. And that's going to make it easier to take that land diplomatically, right? When we conquer that land, people won't see us as a warmonger. They'll see us as just quite simply just getting the land back that we're owed. It is historically ours. We'll be righting a wrong. England was the one that aggressively took that land in the first place. We can see Provence is kind of a... And they got some land that they think is rightfully theirs too. They're actually allied with us though. So we start the game with an alliance. Provence is broken into all these weird little bits over here, which is kind of interesting to think about what the history of Provence is. They are not a subject of ours. They are an independent nation of Provence, and they're kind of like really discombobulated over here. Now, the interesting thing is Burgundy is going to want... Uh, Burgundy is also discombobulated, and they're a rival of us, and they have their own subjects. Some of these are personal unions of Burgundy. So these uh, these nations actually bend the knee to the same king, king of Burgundy. And, and they're a little bit more uh, tightly bound, even than just a, a vassal. But you can see that Burgundy doesn't have these two provinces that are owned by Provence. The Burgundy is going to want to try to take these and link up their land, most likely. That makes sense. And that could get us into a war with Burgundy, because if Burgundy declares war on Provence, we're an ally of, of Provence. We will be, on, we will be um, asked to join that defensive war to defend Provence against Burgundy. So that is something to keep in mind. But if we look at England here, we can see what they're... Oh, they're allied to Portugal already. And a lot of these nations won't be allied to anyone. If we click on Castile, they have no alliances. If we click on Brittany, they have no alliances. And the thing is, at the beginning of the game, the alliances haven't formed yet. You actually need to unpause the game, and the AI will all quickly... All of these hundreds of nations will quickly try to assemble their alliance networks. And you can have... Um, as many alliances as you want, but there's some mo there's some modifiers that we'll have to pay attention to to consider the right balance of how many alliances we actually want to uh, be managing because there is a cost to, to maintaining an alliance, right? There's a certain amount of attention that you need to give to your alliances and stuff like that. So most nations don't have alliances, um, but in this case, England starts with an alliance with Portugal. We start with an alliance on Provence, and, and Burgundy starts with some subjects. We also start with some subjects. That's good to know. That's good to know. Okay. So for the major players here, we got Castile and Aragon like us. In fact, what the heck? Let's ally Castile. Let's ally Castile. We click on Castile. They like us. We can hit this diplomacy tab to quickly get to a diplomacy screen. This shows Castile here. This means we are, we are interacting with Castile. We can get some information about who Castile... Castile is enemies with Austria, Aragon... And Morocco, oh, they're enemies. Are they rivals to Aragon? That's interesting. So Castile might not appreciate us rival, uh, allying both Aragon and Castile, right? Because if we ally, we have to kind of pick between these two. Because Castile doesn't want to ally us if we're also allied to their enemy, right? Castile wants us to know that we're friends with them against Aragon in a sense, in a thematic sense, that we would support them against Aragon rather than have to, uh, you know, pick and choose between the two. But we can expand these tabs here. There's tons of different diplomatic actions in this game. Tons, tons, tons of them. Some of these have little symbols. You can see the offer alliance. Some of these little symbols here show the diplomat needs to uh, basically be persist in these areas. Um, so the diplomat would need to persist here to improve relations. We could just improve relations. If they didn't like us, we could try to make it so they do like us. And, and we could just sort of see over here... I know it bounced around a little bit, I apologize, but basically what I'm trying to say is if we send off this alliance request, it will have to dispatch one of our diplomats. We have three free diplomats right now. And and the alliance is just, they go there, they say, hey, would you like your alliance? They're going to say yes. We can see why they're going to say yes. Well, they have a friendly attitude towards us. They like us. They have good, We have a positive diplomatic reputation. They respect our diplomatic reputation. We have a good reputation in Europe. Uh, Castile's opinion of France, they have a they have a positive opinion. Not only a friendly attitude, but a positive opinion. We have a strong military. They like our strong military, but they actually think we have kind of a weak navy. So one of the reasons they don't want to ally us is we have a weak navy. But overwhelmingly, the reasons for them uh, wanting an alliance is high. It's telling us they will accept. This is not a guessing game. If we hit confirm, they will accept the alliance. Booyah. We've accepted the alliance. Okay. Now, it's going to take nine days for a diplomat to get back home. 
So they sort of instantly teleported to Castile, but it's going to take nine days for them to come back home. But the alliance is made, and now we have too many diplomatic relations. Uh, so these banners are telling us some things that we might want to concern ourselves with at the beginning of the game. So we've picked Castile. They look pretty powerful, right? They look big and relatively powerful. So that'll be a good buddy to have. We also have all of these different subjects, and it's actually warning us, oh no, we have too many diplomatic relations. If we click on this, it'll actually say, uh, oh, oh, sorry, it's still showing Castile. We need to hit this button down here to go to our own diplomacy screen, our internal diplomacy thing. And it could say, wait a second, holy cow, we have eight diplomatic relations out of seven. So this isn't a problem. We got the alliance. It didn't say we couldn't get the alliance. It's just purely suggesting that, hey, you have too much. You're juggling too many different obligations, diplomatic obligations for the size of our country. And throughout time, this can increase. We can do things to increase this number, to have more different relationships and things like that. But we can see here that it's saying right now that we have too many, and that is costing us. That is costing us. That It's actually costing us a penalty of one diplomatic power per month. So we don't know anything about diplomatic power, but it's just saying, you know what, we're gaining four per month. We would be gaining five, except for we're gaining minus one because we have too many diplomatic relations. Oh, well, that's fine. We're still going to be increasing diplomatic power. It's fine. We're just going to get a little bit less than we were before. We'll, t we'll be totally fine. But it is actually telling us here, this is a way to look up all of our diplomatic relations. We're guaranteeing Scotland, apparently. What the heck? We got uh, leading vassals on five different nations. We have an alliance with Provence, which we already knew about, and an alliance with Castile that we just picked up. Guaranteeing Scotland, what is that about? So we go back, oh, Scotland's in purple. So we are guaranteeing the independence of Scotland. We are saying, hey, we're not allied with Scotland, but we are protecting Scotland against English conquest. If England wants to attack Scotland, they're gonna have to deal with us. We're telling England, hey, we're warning England. If you attack Scotland, we will come to Scotland's aid. And maybe we wanna do that, maybe we don't wanna do that. It kind of depends. Um, we don't want England to have a free trip up into Scotland. We want Scotland to exist because if Scotland exists, that puts pressure on England. England, of course, is one of our rivals. We want to keep England as destabilized as possible. Um, so it's strategically to our benefit that Scotland does well in the game. However, we have too many diplomatic relations. And do we really want to go into a war with England just to defend Scotland? Or do we want to go into wars with England to more aggressively go at England ourselves? Uh, on our own choice, right? Because if we, if we, it, it could be that we get into a war with England and we're unprepared because it's not contingent on us attacking England, it's contingent on England attacking Scotland in that situation. That's a way that we could get into a war with England that might not be on the terms that we want. Um, Provence is kind of a weaker nation, but we are kind of the only thing protecting it from Burgundian conquest. However, I mean, we could look at it like, hey, you know, we're allied to Provence, but maybe we want this land for ourselves. Maybe we actually want to attack Provence ourselves. Um, so maybe we actually, what we could do is we could go in here and we could dissolve the alliance with Provence to undo this too many diplomatic relations. But, you know, I think for right now, uh, hmm. that's the thing. It's just a choice. It's like, do we care about the alliance with Provence? Do we want to protect Provence from Burgundy? Is Provence going to be useful for us against our wars in England? Probably. They have, in fact, I could just see right now, what we're seeing on the screen is troop counts. So we could see right now that Provence has a 9,000 standing army right here. And they might be able to even build larger. And we can see that in a different location, how big of an army that they can ultimately muster. We can actually see, holy cow, we got 12,000 troops down here. We got 15,000 troops up here. I'm just recognizing our French crest here. It's a little bit confusing, but these troops are standing in the blue, right? Whereas these are troops that belong to our vassals. So if we add up all of our vassal troops, there's actually a decent amount of troops here. What is that, 12,000, 17,000, uh, plus this, 32,000, 44,000. Plus, you know, we could check and see how many Castile has via a different screen, different menu. Um, but uh, we're, we got a lot of troops here, it seems, right? It seems like we have a lot of troops. We don't know how many England has, but we can look that up. There's a way that we can look that up. So you know what, we have too many diplomatic relations, but we're okay with that. We're going to right-click that and get rid of that for now. It says we, we have too few rifles. If we click on this, it brings up our own diplomacy screen again. It shows us our, our enemies and rifles. Oh, it shows us who's, who's enemy to us. The Ottomans have been enemy to us, probably just because they're very powerful and we're very powerful. And they're just trying to flex. Like, you know what? We're super powerful. You're super powerful. We're going we're gonna to enemy you. But the truth is the Ottomans are so far away. I'm not worried about them. They're not going to do anything to us. They're going to be way more concerned with this area. They're going to be way more concerned with Austria and, you know, like Italy 
and the Mamluks and Lithuania and Poland. Like, the, like Ottomans are going to be so busy over there, they're not going to bother with us. And we don't really care about them. England has rivaled us. We need to rival England. England has our land. We are going to rival England. And what that does is rivaling a country thematically, right? It's going to allow us to justify conflict with them, right? People are going to expect us to go to war with these people. So we don't have to tell Austria, hey, do you mind if we go to war with these people? No, Austria's going to be like, fine. You guys are rivals. Just, just, you know, uh, hash it out. You know, beat each other up a little bit and get it out of your system. You know what I mean? This is going to give us an excuse. It gives us a, a legitimate excuse for conflict with these countries. Um, and it helps us um, do espionage against these countries and, and build up claims against these countries and other things. So it lets us work against these countries more easily as, as these rivals. But however, you can't really rival a country that's insignificant to you, right? Comparable to you. Brittany, we can't rival Brittany. Brittany's not a true rival to the great empire of France, right? Brittany is, is a neighboring nation. We might want to conquer Brittany, but it wouldn't be us contesting a rival. It'd be us just dominating a lesser, weaker nation. In fact, actually, it's saying that the only valid rivals we have are the three that have rivaled us. It doesn't even let us rival Castile. That's interesting to me. Usually you can rival Austria. In fact, actually, I'm kind of wondering, does Austria like us? No, Austria doesn't like us. They have an enemy to us, but they do not like us. Okay, let's, in fact, actually, here's the interesting thing is they've rivaled the Ottomans. If we rival the Ottomans, Austria might like us more. So rivaling nations is actually a way of building a di diplomatic, it's a way of signaling to your allies, hey, these are the enemy, don't, don't collude with the enemy, right? By us rivaling England and Burgundy, it will prevent Castile, who's now our ally. There's sort of a little bit of, you know, like 5D chess going on a little bit uh, with the game, but it's all thematically makes sense, right? If we're allied to Castile... Castile is going to recognize that our enemies are Burgundy and England. And Castile will not want to do business with these people. They'll be more likely to um, sanction them or embargo them or or, or help us in, in wars against them. They certainly won't butter up with them, right? They're going to be hedging the bets that that they're going to be... Um, they're going to treat them a little bit like their own enemies, right? Um, a little bit like their own enemies. And there's also an element of, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend as well. So diplomatically, if other people don't like Burgundy, if Austria and Burgundy become at odds, that will make Austria like us more a little bit because they'll recognize that we're also a common enemy against Burgundy um, and so on and so forth. So that could lead to diplomatic uh, opportunity with Austria. Although Austria did not rival, Austria has rivaled the Pope, the Papal States. And they've rivaled uh, Provence, actually, who we're allied with. That's actually one of the reasons why Austria doesn't like us, is because we're allied to Provence, and they've rivaled Provence. I don't know why they rivaled Provence. Seems like Austria should have better things going on uh, than that, but there you go. So we've got our rivals in order. Now it's saying the there's too low crown line. We're getting a penalty here. We're losing some tax modifier. We're losing uh, some things. Uh, liberty, desire for subject uh, development is actually up. So we have a lot of subjects. We don't want their. We don't want these subjects getting any ideas and becoming independent. Uh, so there's an issue here going on. If we click on this, it takes us to our estate tab. And and keep in mind that if you ever need to go back to um, sort of just like these tabs, your entire nation is basically organized in these tabs. We haven't talked about most of them, but there's a there's economy stuff here. There's trade stuff here. There's technologies here. There's religious stuff here, military stuff, all kinds of stuff. If you ever need to go back to that, you just hit this crest right here, and it brings this up. And we can see we've already visited the diplomatic screen. This shows Austria because we're last visiting Austria. But if we go down here to this button, it goes back to our view. So then it goes back to France. So we've looked at this. It looks like we just clicked on this, and it opened up the far right estate tab. Shortcut key K, apparently. And it's, we're getting some red modifiers here. Crown land is too low. Now, unfortunately, the estates are kind of just this sort of mini game within the game um and and it does say that we need to deal with this for our initial sort of like before we you know just warning it's warning us lightly warning us it is in yellow it's not in red but it is warning us that we're taking some penalties here because our crown land is too low it doesn't tell us however that our crown land needs to be up about 30 percent right now it's 29.99 percent i don't like the way they do this i kind of wish they had it so that uh, it just started at 30 percent and this didn't show up but either way uh, here we go um, we need to get more crown land. Well, there's actually a button to seize crown land from the estate. So the estates represent a internal political dynamic within the country. This is not a diplomacy. This is an internal politics going on within France, right? There are different estates vying for power. There's the nobility, 
There's the uh, traders and merchants, the bourgeoisie or whatever. There's the clergy, the church, right? There's the church, there's the nobility, and then there's the merchant, the mercantile merchant class. And, and the guilds, basically, right? The merchant guilds. And these are different factions that are vying for control, influence, and power over the crown, right? The crown of France. And the crown land is, of course, all the rest of the land that's just owned by the feudal crown. So um, we can seize this land back. This will reduce the loyalty of all the estates and it will reduce some of the uh, land ownership of the estates. We can see that the nobility, for example, controls about 50% of our country is controlled by the nobility, actually. We have about 30% owned by the crown. Not very much is actually owned by the church or the uh, the merchants especially have very little. So we're going to want to hit this button, but it's going to affect our loyalty. This number down here, the loyalty, by 20%. We don't know exactly if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Now, as long as you can keep the loyalty above 30%, then you're fine. Again, 30% is like that bad. We're below 30% crown land, that's bad. If the loyalty goes below 30% for these these estates, that's bad. So in this case, we could safely hit this button. And there it says, rebels may rise up if the estates drop below 30. And that's not going to happen. They're not going to drop below 30. We're going to hit this button, and booyah. Now that negative modifier is gone, we have more crown land. And there's things we can do with our crown land. So that will be useful to accumulate crown land. We can sell it off. You can actually sell off crown land and get money for it and make the estates happy. You could do other things too. Um, and, and actually, these estates are like a, kind of like a little mini game. If, since we're on this tab, we could sort of set them up a little bit. The estates, essentially, these are these are um, guilds and factions within our country that are politically trying to seize power and influence. However, that can be a good thing, right? Like if the church has more influence, that can lead to more income because they'll be promoting tithe, right? Tithing and stuff like that. And so that, you know, and there could be a deal with the crown that, you know, if, if we give the church more influence, the church will pay the crown and so on and so forth. So we can actually increase our, our ability to gain taxes with, with the clergy. Right now we're getting 5% more taxes. The nobility, um, having a strong nobility, like, like generals and, and sort of like a sort of, um, military traditions and things like that is, is adding to a, a larger manpower pool, a larger sort of amount of available soldiers that we can have fighting in our, our armies and stuff. So right now it's 15% uh, faster manpower recovery speed. We haven't talked about manpower much, but very important stat. And then trade efficiency. We can imagine that trade just ties into our economics. So having better trade efficiency from the merchant guilds is great. So so giving the merchant guilds more power means that we'll, have a, we'll be able to build a stronger economy through global trade and through trading with our neighbors and stuff like that, just intrinsically because our merchants are more empowered. But we could actually give them privileges and this will give them more power and the more power we give them the better the benefits right this five percent might turn into ten percent or fifteen percent or twenty percent if we give them more influence so it's a battle between loyalty and influence if they're loyal then the, then this um this modifier is positive if they're disloyal it actually becomes a negative modifier so we don't want them to be disloyal so the fact that they're loyal they're above 30 percent they're literally at 30 percent right now they're at 30%, they are going to uh, give us a positive modifier. Then you check the influence, and the amount of influence that they have, which is 17%, determines the strength of the modifier. So we want them to have more influence. The problem is if they get too much influence, they actually try to take over the country. It becomes a disaster, and they actually try to seize control of the country, uh, which is bad. Um, so it's a balance between giving them enough influence that they give you really good powers and keeping them loyal, but not letting them get so influential that they actually try to take over the country. It's a nice little system. We can click on this and we could just look for some little things here. And these are just little, um, little better. This is, this is not important really if you're a new player, but it is something that we can just sort of set these up a little bit. We can see that giving these, these privileges will give them more influence, which we want them to have more influence and more loyalty equilibrium, which is good as well. Uh, for example, okay, so this makes advisor, uh, administrative advisor cost cheaper. We don't know what that means. The truth is we don't know what a lot of this stuff means. Missionary cost reduction cheaper. Eh, we don't know what that means. Oversight, here's an easy one. No modifier, but it just gives them 10% more loyalty, and it gives them 10% more influence. Now, there is a slight cost to this, but it's way later in the game. Let's give them more, let's give them uh, oversight of oversight by the clergy so we give the clergy a little bit of oversight within the uh, within the court that'll give them more influence and when we unpause it'll modify this so they'll have more influence and they'll have more loyalty what is this right down here church uh sanctuaries 
plus three papal influence is added upon construction of a church building minus three papal influence is added upon the destruction of a church building i don't really expect us to be destroying churches churches are really really good churches increase taxation in their provinces that they're built we don't know anything about churches or building buildings but this just gives them 10 and 10 right very simple i think that that might be another button that we might press that might be another button that we might press there we go we can add four of these in total so actually we have oh actually it looks like the nobility already has something the french strong duchies this is specific to france it gives us plus three diplomatic relationships and it allows us to um, have more dominance and an iron fist over our subjects it gives it lowers their desire for liberty a liberty desire an independence desire for independence but if we look at the nobility here we can look around and and see what we could do here this will give them more influence but won't make them give them more any more loyalty so we could trade taxation for manpower modifier that could be decent right to council again similar to the oversight of the clergy we can give them a little bit more influence they already have a lot of influence actually we want to give them a little bit more um a loyalty is what we'd prefer to do so so that's fine and then with the merchant guilds we can make it uh, free enterprise there you go that's a good one gives them 10 and 10 so there's kind of parallels between them but they do have some specializations that we're not looking at right now because we're not quite sure what some of these modifiers actually mean we haven't looked at our economic situation to know how these can affect our our, our economy and stuff um, trade efficiency just kind of looking around this will give us some yearly prestige and give us some additional prestige immediately we don't know anything about prestige but it sounds like i mean prestige can't be a bad thing right five and five give them a little bit yeah what the heck let's just hit this button it does cost us five percent less taxation um but oh well we'll 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 go for that there we go there we go so we've looked at the estates we've taken care of most of these buttons here if we're just going to finish these up oh we have free advisor slots it was just telling us wait a second it was just telling us something about cheaper advisors right 10 percent uh, more stability costs we don't know anything about stability but it makes the advisor cost 25 percent less for administrative and if we notice there's a counterpart for nobility where it's military advisors uh 10 percent less if we can find it in here here it is aristocratic uh, aristocratic counselors uh minus 25 percent for military advisors and this is telling us hey we have advisor slots free advisor slots no advisor no advisor no advisor this opened up the court the far left tab in this uh this screen no advisor we can look here and be like hey look here's some advisors this guy will increase national tax modifier by 10 percent. that's great this guy will um we don't have enough money to hire this guy it's too expensive you can see that there's a lot of stuff here we actually haven't talked about so i think actually we're gonna we're gonna cover these last two uh tabs and uh start to look we need to look at our economy we need to look at our economy what have we done so far we noticed castile liked us we allied them we know that England has our land and it hates us. So we're going to be going to war with England probably just thematically, right? We're anticipating that. We don't know when. We don't know how yet. But we know that there's going to be conflict between us and England as there was historically in this time period. Burgundy doesn't like us. So we got two ma massive countries, very powerful countries, sort of like giving us a big hug right now. Aragon doesn't hate us, but they don't really want to ally us now that they we've allied Castile because Aragon and Castile don't like each other. We also are allied to Provence. And we realized we have all these little subjects here and we don't know exactly what we can do with them and how we can leverage them france is a little bit of a complicated start there's a lot going on um, in this sort of heart of europe but um so far we've basically just looked at the core gist of, of our environment we've just clicked on some, some things and we've gone down some little baby rabbit holes we took care of a couple alerts that were on these little banners up here that were flashing red and yellow at us and we've taken care of that and now we are ready to look at our internal situation economically like, I don't know, if we're going to war with England, do we want to build more troops? How do we do that? Can we afford that? Can we afford these advisors that it's telling us about? How can we get more money if we don't have money? Right now, we only have 61 bucks. Like, how do we get more, you know? So um, there's, there's a number of different things that we can start to look at in the next episode of this complete beginner series, where we're going to be going rather slow, as you can tell. But the economy, next episode, looking at the economy is going to be a big one. So thanks, everybody, for watching. There will be a playlist linked down below. Of course, if you enjoyed this, subscribing is always great. And it'll help you make sure that you don't miss out on any of these episodes and, and such. And leave a comment and a question. If there's anything that I passed over or took for granted or didn't make clear, please let me know in the comments. However, keep in mind that we will be talking about a lot of these things and repeating ourselves in the future as we continue on uh, in future episodes to really hammer home a lot of these rather complicated and very in-depth uh, gameplay mechanisms. Um, have a good one, everybody. See you guys in the next one.